what I want to do today is take you through very, very quickly. So you remember I did a thousand years in an hour. Uh, was it on Wednesday? Well, today we'll do uh, 25 years, more or less, uh, in the same time. But it's still going to feel very quick. Um, the, the title uh, that I gave for the lecture here is Ukraine's Revolutions, Reform, and Conflict with Russia. Um, maybe not quite in that order. Um, but we're going to try and uh, draw out each of those themes as we go through uh, a pretty uh, intense historical review. Uh, but I will skip relatively quickly over some of the topics uh, that I think you know well or that I don't think need as much emphasis here. So that's uh, my apology in advance. I think also what we're going to do is, since, since we don't have Fyodor to do the joint Q&A, we'll, we'll do a Q&A right after this, either with a short break or not, depending on how we're doing. Um, all right. So getting started, uh, the, the period of glasnost and perestroika in the 1980s, uh, you know, has a distinctive meaning in Ukraine. We've touched on this a few times in this course. Um, there are Russian languages already, Russian language um, publications in the 1980s already talking quite extensively about Stalin's crimes. Uh, that includes an official acknowledgement of the 1932-1933 uh, famine in Ukraine, the Holodomor. Uh, by 1987, there are Ukrainian writers who are talking openly about the decline of Ukrainian language and culture. Uh, and by 1989, uh, there's a Ukrainian, a separate Ukrainian branch of the human rights organization Memorial, uh, a Taras Shevchenko society, which has 150,000 members. Uh, Perestroika, the economic reconstruction program uh, entails the creation of 24,000 cooperatives with over a quarter million employees in Ukraine by 1989, so quite a considerable re-emergence of the private economy, uh, as well as this political group that you see behind me, the Popular Movement of Ukraine for Perestroika, or Ruch. Interesting side note, the idea that Ukraine's leading kind of nationalist, separatist, post-Soviet party uh, would be one that explicitly has support for perestroika, namely the Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev's economic reconstruction program, in its name. Uh, very interesting concept, and it gives you a sense of the degree to which the emergence of nationalisms and national separatist identities uh, is very much born in what Gorbachev uh, unleashes in the 1980s. Um, by July 1989, uh, half a million miners in the Donbass go on strike proving essentially that the party is no longer in control, because remember, of course, the Communist Party is the Workers' Party, right? It controls labor unions. So if half a million laborers are going on strike, clearly the party is not in control. From 1987 uh, onward, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic or, Catholic or Uniate Church, which is probably the most nationalist of the, uh, the two slash three churches present on the territory of Ukraine, uh, is much more active. And it actually gains legal recognition from Moscow in 1989, and many Orthodox priests drop out of essentially the Russian Orthodox slash Ukrainian Orthodox Church and join the Greek Catholic Church because it feels more authentically Ukrainian to them. Of course, we know the story of uh, Chernobyl, April 26, 1986, the date that should be burned into your memories, um, shortly before, as we talked about before, May 1st, 1986, when uh, tens of thousands are exposed to radiation on the May Day Parade on the streets of Kiev. Uh, by the late 1980s, the Communist Party authority uh, is collapsing across the Soviet Union. The March 1989 election to the Congress of People's Deputies results in the election of 231 deputies to the Supreme Rada or uh, Supreme uh, Council in Ukraine. Uh, Forty of them are oppositionists, but in new elections uh, by mid-1990, 125 our oppositionists. So you can see sentiment is bubbling very quickly towards separatism. The first secretary of Ukraine's, the, the Ukrainian Republic's Communist Party, a guy called Vladimir Sherbitsky, uh, he's a real kind of creature of the system. He resigns in 1989, dies in February of 1990. Um, a quarter million Ukrainians give up their Communist Party membership in 1990. Um, and uh, very soon afterwards, essentially, the new Ukrainian Republic is proclaimed. Um, in March 1991, Gorbachev conducts a referendum on whether to preserve the Soviet Union. Seventy and a half percent of voters in Ukraine support preserving the Soviet Union, but the wording that they vote for is, quote, as a renewed federation of equal sovereign republics. So that's very much open to 
your interpretation as to what that actually means. And 80.2% of them explicitly vote for the following language, that Ukraine should only enter the Union, quote, on the basis of the declaration of state sovereignty by Ukraine. So what exactly does that mean, right? We're going to preserve the Soviet Union, but we're only going to do so with the agreement that Ukraine is sovereign and, as, and is uh, part of a renewed federation of equal sovereign republics. So pretty clearly strong sentiment against uh, preserving the Soviet Union as it was. 88% of voters in Galicia, remember we talked about these regions, Halicina, in the far west of Ukraine, 88% vote for complete independence, so severing all ties with Russia and the former Soviet Union. Of course, we know the story of the August 1991 coup, how this uh, precipitates the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. On August 24th, shortly afterwards, uh, Ukraine's Verkhovna Rada votes 346 to 1 in favor of independence. Uh, on August 30th, it bans the Communist Party of Ukraine and nationalizes all property belonging to the party. That's a very big deal because obviously the Communist Party owns a lot of stuff. Uh, December 1st, 1991, uh, a referendum is held, 90.3% of Ukrainians vote in favor of independence, and very interestingly, even a majority in Crimea, although a narrow one, 55% vote in favor of Ukrainian independence from the Soviet Union. Um, now, mind you, that's a Soviet Union which at this point is pretty clearly careening towards Boris Yeltsin being the big boss in Moscow, and so this is in a way even, Ukra even Crimean Ukrainians and Donbass Ukrainians saying no, we do not want to be under the thumb of Moscow at that time, December 1991. Um, at the same time, Leonid Kravchuk is elected first president of Ukraine with 61.5% of the vote. He had been the uh, second secretary of the Ukrainian Communist Party. He himself is from Western Ukraine. Uh, December 8, 1991, of course, the Belovetskaya Pusha Accords are signed. Yeltsin, Kravchuk, and Shushkevich, leaders of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, respectively, essentially signed the Soviet Union out of existence, uh, leaving Mikhail Gorbachev about three weeks in which to sit in more or less an empty office. Um, when we talk about post-1991 independent Ukraine, it does often boil down to a story of these individual leaders, and in part that's because the, the basic dynamics, the kind of factional and institutional dynamics uh, underneath them don't change much in 25 years, and arguably they haven't even changed much to this day. Let me just introduce you again, this is sort of about political cultural literacy, let me introduce you to some of these personalities. Kravchuk, as I said, was second secretary of the Communist Party of Ukraine, becomes chairman of the Supreme Rada, then is elected president. Um, he had been very much used by Moscow. I mean, the guy was a card-carrying, you know, elite Soviet communist, but he had these Western Ukrainian identity and political credentials, and so he was used as an interlocutor with the nationalist movements, including Ruch, as, as someone who was palatable and acceptable to both sides. So not terribly surprising that he's elected to that position. By October 1990, uh, Ruch had 630,000 members. Uh, and its party congress had already endorsed independence. So that's, that's more than a year before Ukrainian independence, and someone had to deal with these people, and Kravchuk was the stucky. Uh, there were various other parties that had emerged, Republicans, Democrats, Democratic revivalists, etc. Now, this other guy whose name I hope you've heard, Leonid Kuchma, um, he is what we call a red director, right? We all know what a red director is. So he's the former director of Pivdenmash or Yuzhmash, uh, which is uh, the big missile factory in Dnipropetrovsk, important for two reasons. One, because it is one of Ukraine's biggest and most important industrial concerns, uh, which means you really have to be a trusted person to run it. It's very prestigious, uh, lots of power, lots of privilege. I mean, you should think about these, these major factory directors as some kind of combination of powerful entrepreneurial industrialists uh, plus, you know, big, big time local or even national political bosses um, plus national security officials, uh, because in the case of Yuzhmash, uh, this is the place that manufactures Soviet ICBMs. So you don't get to be the, the red director, the trusted guy running that place uh, without being very much at the absolute center. And, and if you're at the center of national security in the Soviet Union, who are you dealing with? KGB, right? So this guy is mobbed up in every sense of that term. Uh, he becomes prime minister under uh, Kravchuk in 1992, uh, but resigns following another Donbass miners' strike in September of 1993. So by the way, you're seeing already some signaling, right? Dnipropetrovsk, 
Donbass and Crimea. I'm not, I'm not picking out these names for no reason, right? These are extremely significant political actors within Ukraine as well as Kalichina and Kiev. But these are the major locuses of sort of politically and economically significant activity as early uh, as the late 1980s and the early 1990s and the emergence of independent Ukraine. And that doesn't change. Across 25 years, you want to know, we want to take a temperature check of what's going on in Ukrainian politics. You check in in those five or six places, it's going to tell you right away. So in 1994, uh, new presidential elections are held. Kuchma defeats Kravchuk, uh, largely because voters are in a miserable economic situation. They're frustrated by this sort of radical and harried Ukrainianization of everything, nationalization, because remember, you know, overwhelmingly uh, the, the majority of the Ukrainian population has been speaking Russian in daily life. Uh, they're used to kind of Soviet strictures. Uh, all of a sudden they have this sort of new Ukraine. It doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Uh, and in 99, he's reelected to a second term that goes through 2004. Now, he draws a lot on uh, Russian political strategists known as uh, Polytechnology. I'm sure you've heard that term. Uh, he cuts deals with oligarchs, uh, and he practices more or less the same strategy uh, that Boris Yeltsin does in Moscow, which is to sort of stand up as his straw man opponent, the Communist Party, right? Which, of course, remember, the Communist Party is legally outlawed, but this is kind of the new post-Soviet Communist Party, uh, which has, you know, kind of a smattering of true believers and pensioners and, you know, military folks and so on as their, as their voters. But it's pretty, pretty clear they're never going to achieve an absolute majority. And so this is a, a perfect straw man political opponent. And he routinely beats, just as Gennady Zyuganov continually appears as the bete noir for Boris Yeltsin, Petro Simonenko, the leader of the, of the Ukrainian Communist Party, uh, plays the same role for uh, Kuchma. All right, so how does Kuchma go down? Kuchma Gate, of course, um, a reference to Watergate and all the other scandals that have had gate appended to their name. Um, this guy, Georgi Gangadze, a Ukrainian uh, journalist of Georgian origin, uh, in the fall of 2000 is found, um, disappeared uh, into the woods outside of Kiev. In fact, de beheaded, uh, almost ISIS-like. Uh, the opposition, of course, immediately accuses Kuchma of ordering this killing. Uh, and then, unfortunately for Kuchma, uh, the tapes emerge. And the tapes do seem to indicate that some people very close to Kuchma are, in fact, involved uh, in the disappearance of Gangadze and his murder, um, including some guys who show up quite a lot later on, like this guy, Viktor Yanukovych. You might have heard of him. Uh, at that time, he's governor of Donetsk. Again, Donetsk being one of the major kind of constituencies in Ukraine politically. This guy, Mikhail Azarov, head of the tax service. Does that seem like at all maybe a corrupt post for uh, self-enrichment? Um, so when we talk about the story of Ukraine, so, so this is uh, a lead into what we'll talk about uh, in just a moment, which is the Orange Revolution. Um, Kuchma clearly can't stay around, so he's got to hold a new election, and he's got to sort of anoint a successor, and obviously... He picks this guy, and it doesn't work out so well for him in 2004. But if we talk about the overall dynamics of Ukrainian politics throughout the kind of one and a half to two decades post-1991, you know, much is driven by the economy. And if you just look, just look at this chart, it kind of tells you everything, right? This is when Leonid Kuchma comes to power, right? So Kravchuk here, economy tanks, which pretty much all of the post-Soviet economies do. Kuchma comes to power you know, gradual recovery for a whole host of reasons, right, most of which are not about the genius of Leonid Kuchma. You know, it's just about the, the, the sort of painful embrace of necessary market reforms. You have the booming mid-2000s when Ukraine's economy closely tied uh, to that of Russia recovers. And by the way, I'll say, you know, my own experience in Ukraine, which starts right around this time, so just as they're coming out of this trough, uh, you know, there's almost no appreciable difference between here and here in terms of the physical plant, if you will, you know, the way the road from the airport into the city looks. It's, it's you know, crumbling. It's even more crumbling Soviet high-rises uh, than they were in 91. You know, almost nothing has been built. But then between here and here, comparable amount of time, because I actually, I didn't go to Ukraine from my original uh, month and a half or so that I spent then, until about 2008, I think, was the next time I came back. And then from that time forward, I went a lot. And I just remember being bowled over, you know, arriving in Ukraine in 2008 and seeing this place uh, 
that in some ways even more than Moscow, right? Because Moscow had always had a concentration of wealth and power. I mean, Kiev in, in, in 2000, 2001, like, Kiev was a provincial backwater, right? It was nominally the capital of a big country, the biggest country uh, wholly within Europe. Um, but it really feels like a provincial backwater. You show up in 2008, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, convoys of black, you know, Maybach-type Mercedes with, with like the chase cars, the, the black SUV chase cars. And I'd never seen, you know, uh, a Mustang, uh, Shelby, you know, GT uh, in Europe anywhere, let alone, you know, in post-Soviet Europe. I mean, and this stuff was everywhere. Uh, and, and, of course, all the buildings were beautiful and new and shiny and so forth. So something happened between this year and this year. Uh, which, roughly speaking, had a lot to do with Ukraine's linkage to the Russian economy, which is booming, of course, because of high oil prices and uh, general uh, re-engagement with the global economy. So in 1989, Ukraine's got 52 million people. By 2001, uh, it's down to 48 and a half. And of course, today, it's uh, something more like 42 or 43. In 1990, 45% of the state budget is subsidies to unprofitable enterprises. In 1991, uh, this results in a surge when prices are liberalized, a surge of re retail prices of about eightfold overnight. Um, Eighty percent of Ukraine's large industry was involved in arms production, so the collapse of the Soviet military and the, the end of the Cold War, obviously, uh, is a major blow to Ukraine's economy. And until November of 1992, so until about this point, uh, Ukraine is part of the ruble zone, which means essentially you know, its currency is completely convertible with uh, the Russian ruble. That means basically it's part of a single economy with Russia. But then a new currency called the Karbovanets uh, is introduced. Uh, bad choice, by the way, because technically the Karbovanets is the name that the uh, Nazi occupation administration used for their currency. It, it's a reference back to some kind of uh, medieval uh, uh, Ukrainian currency. Um, but uh, it sort of maybe symbolically was a poor choice uh, because, of course, the, the government behaved in such an irresponsible way with it that it was completely discredited. Um, nominal GDP rises by over 80 percent because so much money is printed, uh, but the inflation is so terrible that they actually have to make subway rides and public phone use free until they can introduce an alternate system like a token system, uh, which, by the way, they used into the 2000s. There used to be like little plastic tokens to ride the Kiev metro as opposed to cards or cash um, because you literally could not bring enough cash uh, to, to do the transaction. And same thing with public phones. Um, you know, average people, not surprisingly, as in Russia and many other places, they survive off of farming small plots of land. Uh, either at their dachas or these little like three hectare slices that they would receive uh, when a collective farm that they had been part, you know, that they had been working for uh, becomes privatized and the land is literally, I mean, this is, by the way, if you think about an irrational way to divide up land, and, and Ukraine, of course, is, you know, a highly agrarian society, right? You've got, so the theory of a collective farm, right, is that you have kind of the, you know, say you have the main highway here, you have like, the sort of collective farm center where you have like your palace of, or your, your sort of house of culture and your school and your big apartment buildings and your statue of Lenin and all this wonderful stuff. And then you have fields out here that everyone goes to. And maybe you have like a, you know, a big uh, cow stable, horse stable thing. And you have your like, maybe your tractor repair shop here. That was a very popular activity. Okay, so this is kind of the theory of a collective farm. And you have even more remote fields out here and some woods and stuff like that, okay? But everyone kind of lives here, or maybe they live in like small houses here, but they all kind of live clustered together, right? So what happens when you just privatize this and you sort of divide it up proportionally? What happens is the like 67-year-old woman living here who doesn't have a car is told, well, you no longer have a job, but look, now you have three hectares of land. This is your land, right? So her son, who lives in the city of Poltava over here, drives out on weekends in his car, picks her up, they go here, and they farm, right? And for like a decade, a decade and a half, until the country can get itself organized with like finance and agribusiness and so on, this is what happens to Ukrainian agriculture. 
This is completely insane, obviously. Buildings like these fall into ruin, right? You see these all over Ukraine, these sort of massive scale collective farm, you know, either the, the tractor maintenance stations. What are, M, what are they called as MT, MTS or like MTS, like Mechanicheski Traktor Nestancier, right? Uh, or these like enormous supersize for like, you know, 500 cows or 500 horses, these giant things, They're total ruins, right? So massive loss of infrastructure. You know, nobody cares about subsidizing all the social services in a little collective farm hub, right? This was, this was Khrushchev's big thing. I mean, this started as early as the 20s and 30s, but Khrushchev was especially big on this, that like each collective farm should be like a mini city, right? You should concentrate people. They should live in apartments, right? You know, like farmers living in apartments. Don't you love this idea? Um, and so what you basically have is, is these giant dead places where you will have kind of stripes of like barren nothing and then there'll be like a stripe of potatoes and then nothing and weeds. Um, yeah, so it was, a, it was a really terrible system. Um, Ukraine became the third largest recipient of U.S. assistance uh, after Egypt and Israel uh, under Kuchma. And by 1999, it has a foreign debt of uh, $13 billion, uh, half of which is owed to the IMF, uh, to the World Bank, and to, to Russia. Um, but nonetheless, and I show some of these pictures for a reason, right? I mean, you know, Ukraine is, is a huge agricultural powerhouse. Everybody knows that. The famous, you know, myth, you drop a stick in the ground in Ukraine and it turns into a tree. But it really is an incredibly fertile place, um, you know, vast, uh, developed agricultural sector, uh, Antonov, uh, sophisticated aircraft manufacturer there for the Soviet Union, uh, obviously uh, steel production, uh, pipes, uh, mining machinery, all of these things in the Donbass, um, <laughs> famous Ukrainian car, the Zaporozhets, but in fact, you know, they do have uh, heavy industrial capability and of course, uh, defense sector manufacturing, including ICBMs, which are not pictured here. So who takes over all of this? These guys, uh, the so-called oligarchs, right? Um, who, who are oligarchs? What are oligarchs? Well, you know, it really, it really depends. There's actually, if you watched um, Stephen Colbert's uh, visit to Russia, was it last week or the week before, he has this whole thing he does with Prokhorov, right, where he, he kind of like, it's all like a riff on the concept of oligarch, you know, almost like a, like a Howard Hughes kind of eccentric millionaire. He says, you know, do you collect your pee and other bodily fluids in jars? Do you do anything else weird? And Prokhorov's like, no, I don't do anything weird. And then he takes him to his like strange Dr. Seussian private um, Taekwondo gym that he has like out in the woods. And Colbert's like, no, you don't do anything weird, buddy. You know, I mean, these guys are completely unmoored from any reality that we know because they're worth billions and billions. And more importantly, they're worth billions in a place, in a context where there is no constraint whatsoever on what money can buy you. Um, they have all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, some former party officials, red directors, who essentially acquire the state industries of which uh, they are entrusted as managers. Uh, for next to none, nothing, uh, you know, in part because they at that moment probably are the most qualified people to run those businesses, but there really is, there's no board of directors, there are no shareholders, so, you know, they manipulate the privatization process to, to get hold of these industries. Uh, in some cases, they simply dismantle them, you know, they sort of uh, slash and burn, pull the heavy metal out of them. Um, there's a <laughs> famous uh, case, or many famous cases, in particular in the Republic of Moldova, where, which had been relatively heavily industrialized, the kind of the western part, not so much. Um, by the way, that, that was the case, you know, uh, throughout the Soviet Union, uh, one of the legacies of the Second World War, and of course of the, the long-term memory of repeated invasions. So if we do the republics of the former Soviet Union roughly like this. Okay, this is Ukraine, this is Moldova, this is Belarus, this is Russia. Uh, you know, what was, what was the Soviet Union's experience in World War II, right? The, the invasion came from here. Uh, and so all of the industry that from Tsarist times was here was sort of physically uprooted and pulled back to beyond the Urals uh, over here. And so in the post-war period where the Soviet Union reinvested massively in reindustrializing these now expanded and moved even farther westward republics, what did they do? Well, when they had the choice for strategic reasons, I'm not making this up, 
they built all their industry here. Okay, so each republic has to have certain things, right? Power plants and steel factories and things like that. But given the choice, they always build them farther east. So it's, it's both kind of like a, a, a psychic holdover and it is also a kind of uh, strategic thing. And in some cases like here, uh, like Ukraine, where you have the bulk of your kind of, um, you know, ethnically Russian, very pro-Russian, very connected to Moscow population down here in the Donbass, it also makes political sense to do this. Uh, but the same is true in Belarus, the same is true in Moldova. Um, so, uh, kind of an aside, but uh, these folks uh, oftentimes are black marketeers, so they're people who really weren't anyone uh, during Soviet times, except that they had some experience with the private sector economy, uh, which uh, put them in a good position when uh, the Soviet system collapses. Um, many of them made money off of uh, essentially arbitrage of Russian oil and gas. Uh, and the theory of this is pretty simple, which is that there was no way in 90, 1991 that you were going to suddenly impose market costs for all natural resources on everyone in the former Soviet Union. So that meant that there was a domestic price, right? Of course, in Soviet times, energy was free. It was free. If you had that, there's one of the reasons uh, people in the former Soviet space today are so obsessed with the notion of uh, electrification or gasification, right? If you live in a small village, do you have gas, right? And that seems like a strange thing to us, right? Because it's like, do you have gas? Well, you have gas if you pay for gas, right? I mean, you know, like go get a thing of propane if you want it or, you know, get the pipeline drawn your house, but you got to pay for it, right? But there is a long standing, again, this is where memory, economics, strategy, and politics all kind of mix together. There's a long standing perception that, well, hey, if you've got the pipelines, then you've got the gas. Right? Now, these are people who, by and large, don't have money to pay for gas, let alone like a sophisticated billing system or even an address. Their address is like the pink house, the third one down, if you go down this dirt lane and ask that babushka at the corner. Right? Like, that's their address. So how are they supposed to be billed for gas? Gas was free. All of this means, and it was free for big enterprises, just as it was free for small individuals. So what does this mean? Right? All of a sudden, you're not in a Cold War. You're not in the Soviet system. In fact, you're in an independent country where you can literally buy yourself exemption from law enforcement, uh, you know, from the Ukrainian authorities or the Moldovan authorities or whatever. So how do you make money? You just take as much gas as you possibly can, pump it out of the pipes that are being happily pumped along from, you know, Western Siberia or whatever to you in Eastern Ukraine. And then you just send it along farther over to Germany or Austria or Hungary or whatever, and you sell it to them. And you make a lot of money this way. So a lot of the origins of, of almost all these oligarch fortunes are in some form of arbitrage of largely Russian-sourced natural resources. And that's part of the reason why I often wonder, you know, why is there this sort of automatic association between Russia and Russian interests and oligarchs in the non-Russian post-Soviet space? And one of the answers is because these, these people had to be connected with Russia to make the kind of money that they made off of natural resources. Um, many of them uh, were quasi-mafiosi, uh, especially in the Donbass. Uh, and so a lot of the famous ones like Alec Grek uh, and Yevhen Sherban uh, were murdered um, famously, you know, like blown away on the airport tarmac after getting out of their Gulf Streams. I mean, this, is, this, was, this was wild stuff. You couldn't make it up. Uh, one of them, uh, Pavlo Lazarenko, pictured down here, uh, was actually Prime Minister of Ukraine from 96 to 97. Uh, he was, this is just a great story, especially here in Northern California. So he served first as governor of Dnipropetrovsk, one of the two major industrial and political centers in Ukraine. Uh, in 1998, uh, he, he has to flee Ukraine uh, because uh, the new authorities are, are after him, or more, more accurately, Kuchma basically turns on him. And he's caught entering Switzerland on a Panamanian passport. Um, somehow he gets himself out. Yeah, that's not a usual thing for a former prime minister of a country to do. Um, he somehow gets, him, gets himself out of those particular charges, uh, avoids being sent back to Ukraine, uh, and in 1999 purchases Eddie Murphy's former mansion in Nevada, California, um, which I don't have a photo of here. I wish I did. It's a pretty sweet pad. Uh, he sets up his uh, girlfriend and his kids and so forth there, um, but is pretty quickly afterward arrested by the United States authorities for money laundering. And in actual fact, 
he was definitely involved in money laundering, and uh, he was involved in schemes that most likely uh, also connected to a lot of Ukrainians who are still active in politics today, including Yulia Tymoshenko. Um, but he was accused in particular of laundering over $200 million uh, from essentially stolen gas sales. And he's imprisoned for a decade here in Northern California and uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, come out again to see the light of day until uh, the late 2000s, uh, at which point he seeks to avoid being sent back to Ukraine for understandable reasons. Um, so various clans, I'm not going to get into the details, but suffice to say, uh, Rinat Akhmetov, briefly the wealthiest man in Europe, uh, ethnically a Tatar, by the way, uh, Viktor Pinchuk, uh, ethnically Jewish, um, uh, Grigory Sirkis, uh, and others, uh, Viktor Medvedchuk, the son-in-law, um, uh, not the son-in-law, the son-in-law, sorry, is Pinchuk, uh, Medvedchuk is the godson. Uh, and they refer to him that way because of his connection with Vladimir Putin. Uh, he's viewed as sort of Putin's representative in Ukrainian politics. Um, all, all these folks, except Lazarenko, are more or less still around. Um, they routinely served in parliament. Uh, the reason to serve in parliament, by the way, they never actually showed up for parliamentary sessions. Why serve in parliament? Immunity, right, parliamentary immunity, so you can't be charged with anything uh, domestically. Um, there's a great quote from uh, uh, Anders Oslin's book uh, referring to a phenomenon called oligarchic pluralism. So why is Ukraine, relatively speaking, more democratic than other post-Soviet states at the time? Because of the oligarchs. See, in this country, the West and East always oppose and balance each other. We are four oligarchic groups, each of which is stronger than the state, and we all hate one another, so we cannot agree on anything but balance one another. Therefore, Ukraine is bound to be a democracy. So what does Ukraine look like? Various state symbols. Uh, we talked in the, in the lecture on historical memory about what some of these things mean. Uh, the Trizub, or Trident, uh, is sort of a, a, a relatively non-controversial figure. Here you have your Cossack warrior, your lion, right, as in like uh, Leopolis, Lviv, right? And then you have your kind of most non-controversial, most universal Ukrainian flag, which is the yellow and the blue for the sky and the wheat fields or the sunflower fields or whatever. Um, Ukraine's national anthem, by the way, uh, very similar to the Polish national anthem. Um, and uh, a lot of symbols uh, that hark back to the uh, inter, very, very brief early interwar period uh, Ukrainian National Republic. Um, the government structures, however, are still those inherited, both the physical buildings and the way that the governing structures work are still those inherited from the Ukrainian uh, so uh, Soviet Republic. So you have a Supreme Rada, which is a parliament, uh, and then you have here, this used to be the, the Cabinet of Ministers, um, or the Council of Ministers in Soviet Ukraine, now it's the Cabinet of Ministers uh, under the Prime Minister and the President. Um, there is basically a constant battle between the president and the parliament. Um, it depends very much on which constitution is ascendant in Ukraine at that moment. So under the constitution of 1996, which was Kuchma's constitution, it is essentially a presidential republic, giving all the powers or many powers to the president. But then when Kuchma loses power in 2004 and his selected successor Yanukovych, we'll talk about in a moment, also loses power, they, the, the Rada votes to uh, give itself more power, and the theory of that being that, of course, these uh, folks who are losing power will reside in the Rada, they'll have more power relative to a weakened President Yushchenko, but then, of course, Yanukovych wins in 2000, January 2010, and so they reverse the amendment by a sort of uh, custom decision of the Ukrainian Supreme Court, which is simply an instrument of the highest bidder, uh, and they go back to the presidential system. Relations with Russia. Um, I, took, uh, I took this photo here uh, in 2008, so the, certainly the, the Crimea issue, right, and it says, you know, uh, hello Russia, goodbye NATO, uh, Russian community of Crimea, uh, Russian bloc party, right? So, you know, this stuff's not imagined, it didn't just suddenly appear in 2014, um, visit of the Russian patriarch to Crimea. Uh, the Black Sea Fleet, right? I mean, the, the, the Crimea issue has been there for a very long time, been very potent. Um, uh, among other places uh, where the former mayor of Moscow, Yuri Lushkov, used to show up peddling his very strange kind of brand of local slash international politics, 
uh, was he would show up in Riga and he would also show up in Crimea, arguing for kind of the unity of, of these, uh, you know, in, in his view of these Russian cities. Um, one of the major issues, of course, at this time uh, is Ukraine's nu nuclear arsenal. Uh, Fyodor talked to you about that. Um, you know, Ukraine inherits 176 Soviet ICBMs with over 1,200 warheads, 800,000 Soviet troops, uh, adequate tanks, artillery, etc., uh, to go with all of that. Um, and of course, the process of kind of disarming all of this, in particular the nuclear weapons, is the big story of the 1990s. Um, after 2000, as, as Kuchma is trying to hold on to power, uh, he finds himself pushed closer to Putin and to the Kremlin, uh, being relatively isolated from the West because of democracy and corruption issues. Um, Russia is often mocked for sort of, uh, or, or maligned for using economic and energy leverage against Ukraine. And here you see the example, again, this is after 2004 when Yushchenko is president of Ukraine. Russia is charging Ukraine $230 per thousand cubic meters for gas, whereas they're charging Belarus, a much more, at that time, loyal ally, $46 per thousand cubic meters. And again, this is all a legacy of the domestic price versus the market price. The market price uh, in the West at that time is actually higher than $230, although later on it drops down. And then Ukrainians are really pissed because they're stuck in a contract to pay more than the market price. Um, so this is very much uh, caught between a rock and a hard place. Okay, uh, I want to move along here. Um, you know, we, we've talked quite a lot about the sort of borderlands concept. I apologize for the blurriness of the slide, but you can see this is kind of one of these Russian fantasies of, you know, how Ukraine's not a real place. In fact, it's, you know, little Russia and new Russia and southern Russia and white Russia. And then, like, there are a few little things over here that, hey, the Central Europeans can have them. We don't want them anyway. Um, here's another theory, uh, Mitrofanov's idea of trading territory with European countries in exchange. So you don't have to go to war to take the territory, but you just make some trades and we'll give away certain blocks and we'll get other blocks and we'll, we'll get the Russia that we're supposed to have. And then you have what they view as kind of the alternate version. Um, often Brzezinski is cited as the kind of Western uh, patriarch of, um, you know, playing geopolitics with Russia and Ukraine. But this illustration is, in fact, from his book, A Geostrategy for Eurasia, 1997. And here he divides Ukraine away from Russia, a Russia which is also itself divided into confederated Russia, right? Because what could be better than having a divided and weakened Russia if you're the grand master of uh, geo of uh, Eurasian uh, geo strategy, and of course, a Ukraine, which is what is uh, part of what's dubbed as Atlanticist Europe. So this is all of this stuff kind of plays into the popular consciousness uh, in Ukraine and Russia uh, of of geopolitics. Um, all right, we've talked an awful lot already about uh, ethnic relations and historical identity in Ukraine. Suffice it to say that if you track each of the Ukrainian elections going back to 1991, so this is where uh, Kravchuk runs against uh, the leader of the then uh, Ukrainian nationalist movement, Vyacheslav Chernovo, uh, you can see Kravchuk, although he himself is very much of an ethnic uh, Ukrainian, he's, he's a former communist apparatchik, so he's seen as the more conventional choice. He wins in the east, and the only place that Chernobyl uh, prevails is in uh, Galicia. Uh, then you see 1994, Kravchuk himself is only supported in Galicia and the far west, uh, defeated by Kuchma, who wins, you know, Crimea, of course, Donbass, and most of the center of the country. Um, then we have 2002, this is the parliamentary elections, uh, Viktor Yushchenko, wins in the West, right? Uh, Communist Party actually does pretty well in, in some of the southern oblasts uh, and the socialists in, in Donetsk. Uh, and then we have 2004, of course, the famous Orange Revolution election where Yushchenko only wins the West, Yanukovych only wins the East. I mean, this is, the, <laughs> the colors and the numbers here are not made up. Uh, Ukraine has, in fact, been that politically divided. Um, so who is this guy, Viktor Yushchenko? Um, he had been a, a banker, head of the National Bank in 1999. He's married to an American-born uh, uh, Ukrainian woman, Katerina Chumachenko, former State Department, in fact. Um, so, you know, if you're 
if you're a Russian or if you're a kind of um, anti-nationalist Ukrainian, what kind of theories are you spinning in your mind? Um, he has this kind of famously love-hate relationship with Yulia Tymoshenko. Um, she uh, had been deputy prime minister under Kuchma, responsible, of course, for energy, right? A very profitable position. She uh, undertook some pretty significant reforms that made her some uh, enemies among the oligarchs, uh, and that in some instances actually helped mid-sized businesses uh, and helped bring in more money for the state budget, but she certainly enriched herself on the side. And then there's this guy, Viktor Yanukovych. Uh, if you haven't gathered already, he's basically a petty crook. He comes from the Donetsk industrial clan. Uh, he's very close with Renat Akhmetov. Uh, he was governor of Donetsk from 1997, served as prime minister under Kuchma 2004 to, uh, 2002 to 2004. Compared to Yushchenko, who uh, is sort of suave and sophisticated and, you know, quite, quite European in his, in his overall uh, mean, uh, Yanukovych really seems, even to Ukrainians, just like a bumpkin, right? Um, he is a native Russian speaker. Uh, his Ukrainian is almost non-existent. Um, limited formal education, twice uh, convicted of uh, criminal offenses in Soviet times. By the way, that phenomenon is oft cited in the Western press. It's actually not quite as pejorative as it might seem. Um, a lot of guys, especially in southeastern Ukraine, have some kind of conviction in their record, mostly just for like public drunkenness or fighting or something like that. So that actually in many ways made him a more appealing candidate, more of a man of the people. Um, and since these are all Soviet con convictions, they're in a sense kind of wiped clean uh, after 1991. Okay, so Orange Revolution. Now this is happening in a context, you have to remember, of color revolutions, right? Why orange, by the way? There's nothing really special and definitely nothing Ukrainian about orange. It's just that that color was not yet taken. I mean, literally, they sort of went through the color wheel. It's like, hey, this is, this is a semi-primary semi color, a secondary color. It's not taken yet. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything yet. It's not red. It doesn't mean communist. You know, it's a, so you had, uh, first, of course, you have Yugoslavia's uh, bloodless revolution or nearly bloodless revolution in 2000. Uh, you have uh, Georgia in 2003 bringing Saakashvili to power, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Lebanon, Ukraine, right? So this is kind of the, the, the map of color revolutions as of the middle of the 2000s. Um, and basically the deal is uh, Yushchenko and Timoshenko, uh, the two parties that they control. So Yushchenko's is called Nasha Ukraina. You saw it does very well in the West. Timoshenko's is called very um, modestly the Bloc of Yulia Timoshenko. They're, they're amazing that way in Ukraine, by the way. You, you know, by the way, that the Poroshenko's party in, in Ukraine today is called the Party of Petro Poroshenko, right? I mean, this is, this is about the degree to which the politics is not gradu graduated beyond, you know, voting for powerful men, right, or powerful women. Um, so the color orange, their slogan is TAK, which means yes. Um, they have both Western money and oligarch money backing them. They do lots of slick television ads. They actually bring in, and I know some of these people personally, so I know it's true. Uh, they bring in veterans of Serbia's 2000 revolution to kind of assist uh, in, in the strategy and so forth. It's, it's not a CIA coup, but it is definitely driven by a lot of experienced um, professional outsiders. Uh, Yanukovych, who is the chosen successor of Kuchma, remember Kuchma can't stay in power because of the Gungadze affair, because of Kuchma gate. Um, and so he has to pick Yanukovych as his successor. He tries to depict Yushchenko as being an extremist Ukrainian, na Ukrainian nationalist, a pawn of the CIA, um, but this doesn't work. The, the Russian uh, political technologists who come in, including famously Gleb Pavlovsky, a guy we've heard a lot from uh, now since he's fallen out with uh, the Kremlin, um, Putin is the most popular single figure in Ukraine at this time. This is an amazing irony, right? 66% of Ukrainians, if they could, would have voted for Vladimir Putin, right? And so the idea of who do the Russians endorse, who do the Russians back, is actually a very valuable asset in Ukrainian politics, and yet it completely backfires, right? Um, the Russians lose ultimately in this process, uh, and the way in which they, the, the, the influence that they have on Ukrainian politics, the way that they choose to shape Ukrainian politics, uh, ultimately uh, re redounds to their detriment. So in September 2004, Yushchenko, this is before the election, Yushchenko is at dinner with the head of Leonid Kuchma's security, uh, and he gets poisoned, the famous dioxin poisoning. That's what causes his face uh, to, to break out in that way. 
Uh, and then at the end of October, uh, the first round of voting is held. And the claimed official result puts uh, Yanukovych ahead of Yushchenko, even though exit polls say that Yushchenko and Yanukovych are tied almost exactly at 39% with maybe a slight edge for Yushchenko. And of course, the, the factor of the Communist Party, Petro Simonenko, is always in there with 5% that you can adjust up or down depending on who you want to help. Um, so the second round is held uh, November 21st as a runoff between uh, Yushchenko and Yanukovych. Exit polls again give Yushchenko the edge, 53% to 44%. Uh, but the Yanukovych team is alleged to have tampered with the election commission results and claim a narrow 50% margin of victory for Yanukovych. Uh, protests immediately break out on the Maidan, as you're seeing above here. Um, 200,000 people gathering before plasma screens with uh, thousands of tents uh, on Khrushchev, which is the main street that runs through Kiev. Uh, the U.S. and the EU refuse to recognize the fraudulent results. Uh, every night, hundreds of thousands of people come out to listen to speeches uh, by Timoshenko in particular and rock concerts. Yushchenko has emerged from the hospital. He says, look at me, I am the face of Ukraine. Look what the Russians have tried to do to us, etc." So a lot of themes that we're now familiar with from the Maidan revolution. Uh, and on December 3rd, the Supreme Court annuls the election results, perhaps smelling which way the political winds are blowing, uh, and they declare a new runoff for December 26th. Um, there are 300,000 Ukrainian and 12,000 foreign observers accredited to this runoff election, so it's pretty hard to pull off any kind of fraud with that many observers. And the result is 52% for Yushchenko and 44% for Yanukovych. Uh, by the way, side note, any time you have a major public demonstration like this, a sort of spontaneous demonstration, it's always worth asking the question, it doesn't change necessarily the political dynamics, but it's worth asking the question, okay, this is the dead of winter in Central Europe, where did all the tents come from? Where did all the, pub, you know, the, the, the public electricity for the space heaters, the uh, big uh, plasma screens that people are watching the speeches, the loudspeakers, the matching flags and matching uh, ponchos and all, like, where did it all come from, right? Again, not, it's not to discredit this movement, it's to ask, there is clearly money behind it, so whose money is it? Um, and one of the kind of themes of the Orange Revolution <laughs> that I recall from that time is that this was the revolt of medium business against big business. So the oligarchs, which had been taking kind of everything, right, and any time there was like a halfway successful medium-sized entrepreneur, they'd get screwed, the oligarchs were all clearly ready to back Yanukovych as Kuchma's chosen successor. But then the medium-sized businessmen say, no, we don't want another decade of this. And so they support Yushchenko and Timoshenko and this movement. Um, and that's why these people have money behind them. And frankly, uh, the oligarchs who think that they have it all locked up and they have support from the Kremlin and everything, they're taken by surprise and they lose. All right, very, very briefly, the Yushchenko government in which Yushchenko's president, Timoshenko's prime minister, is an unmitigated disaster in almost every way. Obviously, he pursues NATO membership. That does not end well. Um, he uh, elevates kind of the, the status of this Ukrainian national memory mythology stuff, including the uh, wartime uh, upa uon uh, fighters who are viewed by many as Nazi collaborators. Uh, these two, not surprisingly, don't get along. Basically, everything that can go wrong goes wrong. Uh, Ukraine and Russia get into a winter so-called gas war, where on January uh, 1st, 2006, Gazprom cuts gas supplies to Ukraine for not paying its bill. Now, by the way, when you know the, the, the main pipeline goes through Ukraine, the, about 80% at this time uh, serving Europe. So when you say uh, Russia cuts off gas supplies, to Ukraine, what you're actually saying is it reduces by a certain percentage the volume of gas that's tra transiting through Ukrainian territory. That doesn't stop Ukrainians from taking gas out of the pipeline, right? Both ordinary people and factories and oligarchs who are stealing it and selling it, right? What it means is by the time you get to the end of the stream, right, somewhere in Germany or Austria or something like that, there's nothing left. And so the Germans or Austrians who in good faith or Italians or whoever thought they had bought that gas, they find that they turn on the tap and there's no gas coming out. So 
while it is true that this was partly a way for Gazprom to sort of, you know, freeze the Ukrainians out for not paying their bills in, in the dead of winter, uh, more than anything, it was a way of shifting the pressure mechanism onto Western Europe so that they would come back and knock on Yushchenko and Timoshenko's door and say, pay your bill to Gazprom because we're expecting the gas. This is just a very brief word on how the dynamics of uh, energy warfare in Europe worked in the mid-2000s. Um, so new elections, errata elections, parliamentary elections are held in March of 2006. Once again, you see, you see the divide of Ukraine here. Um, and actually, you know, what you have to understand, it often looks like this is a majority here just because it looks like a little bit more of the map. In actual fact, in terms of total numbers of votes, um, this territory is much more densely populated. And so uh, Yanukovych's party of regions, Bloc, actually uh, wins in the Rada. And uh, Timoshenko is the largest minority party. And as you can see, Yushchenko is already on his way out. Just two years after the successful Orange Revolution, 2006 elections, um, excuse me, he is only able to win uh, uh, Galicia. I mean, this is, how, how often have we seen this dynamic over and over and over in Ukrainian politics where somebody initially comes in, maybe even starts with their support here, and then over time in power, as they become kind of identified with uh, Ukrainian uh, sort of with, with ideas that don't resonate with all of Ukraine, their support kind of contracts and contracts and contracts and ends up only here in Galicia, right? We saw this with uh, Kravchuk as well. Um, okay. So, 2010. Viktor Yanukovych is himself legitimately elected uh, president January 2010, and it's thought of as the end of the Orange Revolution, um, which, again, is a period that begins with tremendous hope um, and ends with um, tremendous uh, disappointment, and that entails all of the well-known problems. And Yulia Tymoshenko, by the way, lest, lest we think of her as being a sort of inveterate foe of the powers that be, including of Vladimir Putin, um, she was actually Putin's favorite candidate in the 2010 election. So he actually chose her over Yanukovych in 2010. And again, the Russians lost, despite their political technologists and so forth. So Yanukovych comes in, same divide. I mean, I could just show you this map over and over and over. Um, Yanukovych wins. Uh, he assembles a team which is initially a little bit broader, uh, and then he narrows it down in the 2012 election, consolidates his power, and these are basically all members of the so-called Yanukovych family. So he's building his own uh, political vertical of power. Okay. Last, I want to do the Euromaidan. So I was living in Kiev with my family uh, in the spring and summer of 2013, so right on the eve of the Euromaidan. And the most important thing I can tell you is that um, sociologists, surveys, but just the mood on the street uh, told anyone who was willing to listen that something was about to happen in Ukraine, okay? The feeling that the situation under Yanukovych with this, this just incredible concentration. So Yanukovych was turning himself into the capo de tutti capi of basically a mafia state. He was concentrating all the power of wealth and in, power and wealth in his own hands and in the hands of his family. So his son, uh, Alexander Yanukovych, this guy, who was a dentist, went from being worth something like $4 million, so he was already doing very well for a dentist, to being worth like $400 million in the course of a year and a half, right? So uh, a lot of gold fillings. I mean, I'm not really sure how you do that. Uh, these guys were, were doing things that were, to say the least, not endearing them uh, to the Ukrainian people, let alone to the other oligarchs uh, whom they were often raiding and taking advantage of. So in May of 2013, this is actually a photo that I took when we were just out for a walk um, with our daughter in a stroller. Uh, there were rival groups uh, protesting. This was, of course, the Battle of Holidays, May 9th. Victory Day is the sort of, sort of Russian-oriented, Eastern Ukrainian uh, notion of, of celebrating victory versus the very same day, the kind of <clears throat> pro-Western, anti-Russian forces, they celebrate Day of Europe. And so there are these two battling crowds. And I remember actually being up uh, in Marinsky Park, which is uh, around the Rada and the Marinsky Palace, beautiful place on the bluffs overlooking the river in Kiev. I would jog there every morning. That morning was no exception, May 9th. And what do I see? I see these just 
huge, huge crowds of people who clearly are not from the capital, um, who are gathering, who are having banners and flags and uh, ponchos and things given to them. They've clearly been purchased. Everything is organized. I didn't see any money changing hands, but I have no doubt that they were being paid for their time. The buses were provided. So all of these things were being constructed in order to create uh, a, a very explosive political atmosphere. And in fact, there was some violence on this day. We thankfully were not there when it happened. But it's alleged that the, um, the police, believe it or not, were on rooftops directing groups of thugs, which uh, came to be known as titushki, um, who would wear these, um, you know, like gym clothes, right? They were like very well built, very scary guys. They'd run around, they'd beat up journalists who were covering parts of the protest that they didn't want covered, or protesters from the opposite side, and so on. So it was bad. What was the reason, though, ultimately for the Euromaidan, right? It wasn't about geopolitics. It wasn't even really about domestic politics per se. It was about corruption, right? This is Viktor Yanukovych's house uh, called Mejiria. Uh, it is on a Ukrainian national estate, which belongs to the people of Ukraine of about 400 hectares called Mejiria. So that house looks a little bit rustic to us. It maybe looks like a Montana lake house or something like that. Suffice to say, it is not rustic inside. Um, I, I took all these pictures. Uh, it is, I was able to get in there actually very shortly after um, uh, in the spring of uh, 2014. It was still being occupied by Maidan protesters at that time. I remember Yulia and Sasha, literally a, a, a young man and a young woman. They, they had tables up against the windows. Their, their narrative was, you know, we knew we had to occupy it, but then we didn't know who was coming. So we didn't let anyone else in and we didn't trust anyone, but they were giving certain select people tours. So you can see, I mean, these are like, um, they say that the, you know, the house cost something like a billion dollars to build, but you know, everything inside it was, who knows, countless, countless billions uh, in terms of value. You know, he had the finest artists and artisans. That was one of two bowling alleys in the house. Um, that's his private pirate ship restaurant. Um, <laughs> His private, you can't make this stuff up, his private boxing gym, one of two billiard rooms. Um, that's his private uh, Orthodox chapel, which was uh, even still, even though he absconded with most of the valuable art, and you would actually see, um, this, is, this is like, the, it's like from something out of World War II, you would actually see the big frames that oil paintings had been in. With, with the painting sliced out, right? Like leaning up against the walls. And you cannot make, like every hallway, including the underground hallways. Again, it's like something out of Hitler's bunker. The underground hallways had been lined with priceless art. Um, and the frames were just lying on the ground because the art had been sliced out, rolled up, and taken away. Uh, obviously, you know, your stuffed lion, because why would you not have a stuffed lion? <laughs> By the way, that, that, that particular spot, I recall, very nicely lit was the entrance to the uh, like private nail beauty and massage salon that he had had built for his girlfriend on, on the campus, if you will. Uh, huge collection of exotic cars and exotic animals, including, by the way, American classic cars, um, Soviet military vehicles, American military vehicles. Um, by the way, do you know what his zoo of exotic animals was for? This was not a petting zoo. Meat. This is so that he could serve things like Ibex meat or whatever to his guests. Because again, what do you get for the man who has everything, right? An Ibex steak. Um, all right, so, that, so this, is about, this is about corruption, right? Um, you know, just a few examples. The Euro 2012 soccer championship, which um, I actually got to watch. It was very cool. Um, uh, I watched uh, Italy uh, deal handily with England. Um, by the way, from, I, I got to watch that from the cheap seats, and for whatever reason, sitting in front of me uh, was um, the, uh, the now mayor of Kiev, Klitschko, the boxer. And I didn't realize it for like the first half hour, and the guy sitting next to me sort of like, I was like, look at this guy. And, uh, and I like sort of tried to make eye contact with him, but he had headphones in. He stayed for about half an hour. I mean, you could tell it was him, right? The guy was like, you know, wider than, than a door. Um, and, uh, and then he, just, he stayed just long enough that everyone could photograph him with their cell phones from up in the nosebleeds. And then he disappeared, and I'm sure he went to one of the oligarch boxes, because, like, why would you not? Um, but he made sure first to get himself 
photographed among the hoi polloi. He like barely fit in the seat. It was it was pretty funny. So so the Euro 2012 soccer championship. This is just the comparative costs of all of the expenses around that versus you know for example what the Poles spent or what the Brazilian South Africans etc. spent to do comparable uh, sporting tournaments. And and where does the where does the delta go? Right. It's it's all stolen obviously. Um, or the famous case of Boyko's oil platforms. Boyko is the Minister of Energy. Uh, two oil rigs are purchased on the international market for $400 million each. So this is an $800 million purchase, nearly a billion dollars. However, the market price for these things, like if you just call the Chinese company that makes these oil platforms, the market price is $200 million. So why would they have paid double the market price, right? Like you just wait, just giving away money? No, obviously they paid through a middleman, and the additional two hundred million just goes into the energy minister's pockets, and whoever else's pockets have to be lined. Uh, or I love this one: the case of Yanukovych's best-selling book from an unknown Donetsk publisher, which is being issued in English as well in Europe through some uh, Vienna-based publisher, for which Yanukovych is paid a two, a two million dollar honorarium. No one can find copies of this book anywhere. It's as if it never exists, right? But when asked to justify the $2 million payment, this is what the Vienna publisher says. Why? It's for this lovely book. Um, all right, so, so you get the sense. He even comes to be known as Bandukovich, right? Uh, Yanukovych, the, the bandit. Um, so the protest itself, why does it begin? Well, famously on November 23rd, Yanukovych announces that he is not going to sign the association agreement with the European Union. We've talked about what that means. Initially, a guy called Mustafa Nayem, who is an Afghan-born Ukrainian journalist, he posts on Facebook, hey, this is BS, let's all turn up on the Maidan at midnight um, and just, you know, register how angry we are. So Mustafa shows up at midnight. He says there are like a couple dozen people there at most. They hang out for a couple of hours and they go home. Then the next day, he starts to see in the news that people are gathering by the tens or hundreds of thousands. Students, NGOs, but interestingly, not political parties. This is not something the parties have yet glommed onto and realized is going to be politically significant. And that tells you that the origin of this protest really is not with either international money or Russian political technologists uh, or with the Ukrainian oligarchic groups. It really is authentically uh, originating with the people. And in fact, almost certainly would have fizzled uh, following the Vilnius EU-Ukraine uh, summit, which is at the end of November, except the Ukrainian government does something stupid. Uh, on the night of November 29th, 30th, they beat up a bunch of these student Maidan protesters. And then hundreds of thousands more people turn out the next day and the day after that and the day after that. And they say now their demands are still not political and still not geopolitical, but they say you need to punish the people responsible for beating up our young people. And social media starts to play a role. Facebook is used uh, for uh, essentially just as a kind of static um, home for information about what's going on the Maidan, what kind of needs people have, how to, how to help. Um, uh, it's also used to let other people know that you are supportive, right? So among the various reasons that people went to Maidan, 40% cite that my friend or family member posted on Facebook and said that they were going. So I felt safe, you know, safety in numbers. Um, Twitter postings, you can see each of these, just I won't go through the details, but take my word for it that each of these spikes in Twitter events correlates with a major event on Maidan. So you can see Twitter played a big role too. But of course, technology is also a two-way street. Um, so you would have uh, seen had you uh, had a, uh, a, an internet-connected device or a, a, an SMS-connected device, you would have seen this message uh, on the Maidan uh, on the 21st of January. It says, uh, dear subscriber, uh, you have been registered as a participant in mass demonstrations or mass uh, mass uh, violations. Yeah, so that's uh, a bit disconcerting to say the least, because obviously if they <laughs> if they know where you are, they know who you are, and they have just said uh, you're going to get some. So so that's that's not so good. Um, and then the Ukrainian government does something really stupid, which is the Maidan protests continue all through December and into early January. 
Uh, and they have the Rada, the parliament, pass a series of so-called dictatorship laws. And you should think of these as basically the anti-Bill of Rights, right? So all the things that the Maidan protesters are doing uh, are now made illegal. Uh, so you can't stand in front of somebody's house with a sign. Uh, you can't distribute materials attacking the president. Um, you can't gather in groups and violate public order. Um, you can't drive in a column of more than five cars because this was something, there was something called the Auto Maidan and a bunch of cars would get together and sort of honk their horns and protest. But basically you can't do anything. You have no rights to protest. Imagine how people reacted to this. So by, by the end of January, there is a whole different dynamic to the Maidan protests. It has become an all-out war uh, between opponents of the regime uh, and forces loyal to the regime, which are largely the riot police, although they're also bussing in you know, Donetsk miners and the whole, it's the whole old story now. Though the thing originates in a very authentic mass protest of students and NGOs and, and simple people, um, it becomes this same sort of geopolitical and big ticket, you know, national oligarch political fight with lots of money uh, and ultimately weapons on all sides. The center of Kiev is destroyed. This was, I, I watched, I did not go there uh, during this time period, um, unlike many of my journalist friends, but I watched a lot of this stuff uh, unfold live. There, there were a number of live feeds being broadcast from the Maidan. And, you know, honestly, watching this, we, we lived about 50 yards from where all of this stuff happened, just around the corner from the Besarabsky uh, Rynak, the if you know what it is, it's sort of at one end of of the center as defined by Khrushchev. And and I literally would watch live footage of like uh, troops in riot gear gathering on street corners where we where we had like met friends a couple of months before that, and it was just very surreal to watch this happening. The other surreal dimension to all of this is that while it's happening. It's really only affecting the center of the city, and I'll show you a map in a second. I mean, you, you could go like six blocks away from it, and you would still have like the classic, you know, Kiev fashion plate woman in the leopard print skirt and like the high heels with the Gucci bag, like walking to a cafe. You'd be like, you know, how 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 do these two things mesh together? I mean, most of the stores, obviously, along Krishatik were closed, although some of them resolutely remained open to provide food and, and warmth and shelter. Here you can see the, um, you guys can probably figure out, right, what that means, garbage truck, right, the graffiti. This was a, this was a bus that had been ferrying riot police. Okay, uh, so this is how the center of the city is laid out uh, during the protest. This is essentially, think of this as kind of government hill. Uh, you have the Rada here in Marinsky Park, um, the presidential administration known as Bankova here. The center of the protest movement is here, um, the trade union building, the Maidan itself, uh, Hishatik Street. Uh, we had lived like right here. Um, and then this uh, on Khrushchevsky Street, which is here, this is where a lot of the fighting happened, um, where you had kind of government forces up on the hills, kind of sniper fighting. You had barricades uh, on all the major streets. Um, but this is, you know, the, the key objects to have been seized if the protesters had wanted to do that were obviously here, right? You have Bankova, you have uh, the National Bank, um, excuse me, you have the Parliament Building, you have the National Bank, I don't know where it is, anyway, and you have the, the Cabinet of Ministers. So this is where a lot of the fighting takes place. Uh, and as I mentioned, you, you do have these, um, these snipers on the hilltops, and it's in February um, that things turn uh, even worse uh, and the casualties, casualties start to mount, uh, with literally uh, people being picked off by snipers and shot in the head. Now, there are weapons on both sides. You can see the protesters have Molotov cocktails. Uh, one of the points made to me by a friend who was, who was on the Maidan, and this guy was by no means a defender of the government, but he did point out, you know, it's interesting that this was clearly not uh, an economic revolution, because if you looked at the people on the Maidan, a lot of them had, like, really nice like mo motorcycle jackets or ski jackets. Um, they would be wearing like snowboard helmets. You know, uh, ordinary poor people don't have snowboard helmets. That's sort of a good rule of thumb. Um, so this was very much of a kind of middle class, a thinking class, an educated person's uh, movement uh, against the state. Now, on the night of February 21st, uh, Viktor Yanukovych uh, begins evacuating. You can see the truck in the background. 
begins evacuating his possessions uh, from Mishiria. That's, that's him at his estate. Um, and as a result, uh, even though on uh, February uh, 23rd, uh, excuse me, yeah, on February 21st, the EU brokers a deal that is accepted by all sides, uh, with the Russians as witnesses to this, by the way, uh, Ambassador Lukin, a former ambassador of the United States, actually witnesses the agreement, uh, but doesn't sign it on behalf of Russia. Nonetheless, Yanukovych flees initially to Crimea, then to Kharkiv, and then ultimately to Russia. It's a story that's told now in, um, in the Russian documentary, which I recommend you watch because it's just fascinating, called Crimea Return Home. And Putin personally tells the story, essentially, of how he was in the sit room, uh, you know, basically, uh, he, he had actually been in Sochi for the, for the Winter Olympics, which the Russians were hosting in Sochi, and he basically tells the story of how he rescues Yanukovych. Um, okay, so last, last piece of this. Um, what's Russia up to all along? Well, of course, the invasion of Crimea, we now know very well, uh, roughly speaking, the last week of February uh, into early March. Uh, media attention grows, shifts from the Maidan to Crimea. There's the whole ambiguous story of the little green men, which initially Russia says, we don't know who they are. They're clearly some kind of local forces. Later on, Putin proudly acknowledges that these are Russians. Um, the, uh, the takeover of Crimea is achieved largely bloodlessly. Um, that is not the case in Donbass and eastern Ukraine, uh, which I'm going to talk a lot more about tomorrow where fighting between pro-Russian separatists and pro-Ukrainian uh, militias had already killed dozens uh, in the early spring of 2014, and of course many thousands more casualties are coming after that. Um, why don't I, let's see, why don't I stop it there and we'll, we'll take a short break and do a discussion. <laughs>